I said, you better go catch it. But I did it in clown voice, and each time he got upset and started crying. No! No! Oh. I, don't, I don't want to catch anyone in or out of a camp. Oh, God. Um, you know, because I was talking about it and me rewatching it the other week, Yeah, uh, Lucy binged the entirety of the It miniseries the other day. Well, there's only two two episodes of it. Yeah, but it feels like a million years long. It is a million years long, but there's still only two episodes She couldn't help it. herself, and do you know what she said at the end of it? What? I actually really like that. I mean, yeah. It, it's, it's way better than I thought it was. I'm not saying I don't like it. I'm just saying I think it's bad. So we're filing for divorce. <laughs> um, we're not. I like it, but not, it's bad. We're not. If anything, it's made us stronger because now I want to get the help she needs. Oh! I like it too. <laughs> but do you know what else I like? Uh, no. I have no idea what you like because you're such a, a quiet and reserved person who always keeps their opinions to themselves. I'll give you a clue. It's in the thumbnail. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, in case you didn't get that, I was being somewhat sarcastic. Um, it's our brand. The Big Dumb Cast. You're listening to the Big Dumb Cast. Sarcasm is our brand. Nerdy news, geeky gossip, stuff to occupy your time on the long inevitable road to your demise. Sarcasm. My name is uh, Chris. Uh, go eat your lovely beans on toast, Johnson. Mm, sarcasm is my name. And you shall hear it ringing in your ears for a thousand centuries. It's Matt, actually. Matt's Matt in Matt. Spanish. Yeah. Um, uh, what we're doing right now, as you probably noticed from the thumbnail, you're thinking, hey, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. You guys are two lifelong two fans, but you only ever reluctantly talk about those. Only reluctantly. Well. Get ready for lots of reluctance. As you're listening to this, I'm not here anymore. I've, I've passed on. This episode has actually killed him. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not here next week either. So, this is a two-part extravaganza, but we can't just leave y'all with some gubbins. Um, well, we can. We've been doing, doing, week. Week. We doing that for three years. Yeah. Come on. But we decided to leave y'all with gubbins that you picked. Yeah. And we put a poll up on Twitter saying, right, which of these two oft-teased um, subjects do you want us to cover in this two-part, read them, two-part special? Uh, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer solely lost out in the end, uh, so to live to fight for another day, um, to the Russell T. Davies era Doctor Who. Now, the reason this is a topic that we wanted to cover at some point is because we moan a lot about Doctor Who. We praised a lot of the modern stuff too, but we, we our, most of our Doctor Who centric episodes before have been big moan fests. Well, yeah, because we moan, it may have been going on during the Peter Capaldi era, which. In our opinion, was something of a low point for the quality of the show. Yeah, which was uh, uh, bulbous and sweating and throbbing peat meat. Throbbing peat meat. It was the Peter Recapaldi uh, two-parter. And, you know, we've talked classic Doctor Who, we've talked modern Doctor Who, we've nattered on about it, but let's spread some love. Let's spread it all over, baby. Like margarine. Now... No, I prefer butter. Oh. I'll, I'll... I like the dairy. Oh, I was waiting for you to say something filthier. Oh dear, no. You like the white, creamy stuff? Ah! But it should not be white and creamy. If it no, is, then you've true. not. It's not. It's not. It's not ready. Saltier. You need to shake it more. It needs to be saltier. Shake what more? <laughs> so enough of this filth. Churn it. Churn it harder. We're gonna dive in. We're gonna do this similar to what we did with the Ricapaldi, which is we're gonna go episode by episode and just chat a little bit about each one. What we thought. We are starting with 2005's series one of Modern Doctor Who. Yeah. The Chris Return. And Billy Piper. And I'm going to end with the 2010 New Year's Day episode, The End of Time Part 2. That is where we're beginning. That is where we're ending. Uh, and this week, we're going to be talking about Series 1 and 2. Yes. Matthew Bartholomew Erogenous Zones Watson. <laughs> That's what they call me. <laughs> we talked about this briefly on 9 is 10. Yeah, uh, we did. Boomtown episode. Go listen to it. It's at the bottom of this feed. If you're mm-hmm. Spotify. Uh, keep scrolling. Scrolling, Booting scrolling, episode. scrolling. The booting episode. Keep scrolling, 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 scrolling. What? We, talk, we talked a little bit about where you were in 2005 when the show came back and, and stuff, but just uh, briefly, what 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 was the haps? You were a lifelong Doctor Who fan. You I was a lifelong the, Doctor Who fan. I, was, I grew VHSs. up on VHSs and Doctor Who magazine, The Odd Virgin, New Adventure, because we couldn't afford books. We were so poor. We could afford books, we just didn't buy them. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> it was a joke. Uh, some of the BBC book stuff. Obviously, the Egg Doctor TV movie came. I remember that coming out and watching that when it went out and getting the VHS and all that. All that good stuff. And um, I think Big Finish had been doing it for a couple of years by that point. 
they've, uh, they've picked yes, up the licensing they've been so we dabbled in the big finish stuff but again we weren't in really in a position to buy a new fucking audio drama every two weeks or whatever and this was before the box sets were yeah like 40 pounds for three cds yeah um, every week so yeah when it came back i was excited i'd just graduated high school i'd started college i was uh you know enjoying life more or less and the TV show that I grew up loving was coming back, and then Christopher Eccleston was playing it. Salford's own Christopher Eccleston. And Billy Piper was going to be the companion, and Billy Piper seemed okay at that point. Like, one of those uh, pop stars turned actors that you're like, oh, actually, she might, she's actually pretty good. So, you know, that was cool. And then it came back, and it was brilliant. And that's it. That's the episode for this week. That's uh, it, guys. We'll so... see you next week for... Uh... Season three, four in the specials. Bye, everybody. Bye. Wheat. Um, nil. Uh, no. <laughs> so you're happy to see it return? Oh I, yeah, I was over the moon. I was aware of it because my first memory is the TV movie. Seeing the TV movie go out, and my dad being really excited about this thing on the telly. Yeah. And then I went to like the was it the the toy museum? Um. Oh the the. Clangoffin da- one, the yeah. Dapple Factory with the with the exhibition attached. So I went to that, and then UK Gold and BBC Two in the late nineties started into repeat seasons. Of yeah, Virtue I and... always wanted to watch that stuff. But I didn't have UK Gold, so yeah, we, we, was... had, we had it at my dad's, and and so it was like uh, every second weekend I'd be like, oh, Doctor Who might be on, so I'd catch bits of stories. Um, so John, a... John Percy became my Doctor through that because I was just like, this is great. He's great. These stories are brilliant. Yeah, I'm loving it. Um, and then didn't help my fear of mannequins at all. Nope. And then, uh, yeah, in the early two thousands, one of the fir- BB- BBC television boys and girls uh, released a wave of DVDs in nineteen ninety nine. I think it was. It was like the first wave of BBC specific. DVDs. Yeah, and they were all silver cases. All silver cases, and, and it was like them, it yeah. was Blackadder the third. Yeah. So series three of Blackadder. Uh, Blackadder's Christmas Carol, the special. Um. Pride and Prejudice? Pride and Prejudice. One of the only Fools and Horses specials from the 90s. Um, Jesus. Faulty Towers Series 1, I think? And, Sounds right. And The Five Doctors. Th- those were like, hey, BBC are releasing DVDs. Here are seven titles not, for you to enjoy, boys Not and The girls. Five Faces of Doctor Who. No. But The Five Doctors. <laughs> Imagine if they did a box set, the five, face, the, the, the five Faces of Doctor Who stories that they did the rerun season of. They could do, but like they're gonna have to wait until the series, the Blu-ray season collections have been and gone, so they can go. Well, if you don't want to spend a full box set, you can buy a compilation. Oh, yeah, just have the first five in one lovely box set. Put it in your eye. Oh. And uh, yeah, so they that got a lot of mileage. I basically destroyed that DVD through replay, mm-hmm. constant replay. So it's like, oh my god, it's that thing that we watched, and it's that dude with the the, the white silver mane and the strange old young face. <laughs> um, oh. and, uh, Uncle Terence. Oh, Uncle Terry. Oh, um, I miss thee. And it was, I, I miss thee, Uncle Terence. Um, mm. Wibbly wobbly. Um, just after he passed, we were watching the special features on the Time Warrior, and it's just, oh. it's just, it's just him and Barry Letts on location chatting about it both like, now gone oh, yeah sadly. barry i kind of looked like the master let's uh, he did though didn't he like yeah he got a, I'll, i've got a i've got a cop to that yeah he does a but bit we, we, we were fans so hearing it was coming back was pretty exciting and uh it was coming back from the guy who brought us um queer as folk and uh bomb rose and the second coming yeah i i had recently seen the second coming yeah. Because it was a, what, a couple of years before Doctor 2003. Who. 2003. Yeah. It was the project that he and, and Chris Eccleston, Rusty Davis and Chris Eccleston worked on together. Yeah. That then when Chris sort of put his oar in um, for the Doctor. Yeah. So like, I'd be interested. Russell was like, right, I'm definitely writing it for you. I, <laughs> like, I, it's happening. I saw the second one and was like, that was fucking good. And then when I heard it was Rusty and uh, Eccleston, I was like, yeah, all right, cool, <laughs> cool. The last thing of Russell's I watched before the new series kicked off, though, was Casanova on BBC. Yeah, Three. that was literally just before. It was just before. It was a TV miniseries. Yeah. Uh, three feature length episodes, I think it is. Mm-hmm. Um, Sounds right. And it's amazing. It, it is It is the stories of Casanova, you know, the legendary Lothario and lover and and uh, adventurer and entrepreneur and all this. It does um, not, unfortunately, feature Casanunda, the world's second greatest lover. Oh, God. <laughs> And that's a Terry Pratchett gag, so you can't Pratchett blame me gag. for that. It's a good gag. Um, I just wasn't expecting it. 
So, um, Casanova was great and stars some bloke called David Tennant. We'll get back to him. And uh, Peter O'Toole is the older Casanova telling the story. Oh, yeah. Okay. And it's really bloody good. And so when I heard he was doing Doctor Who, that was the most recent thing I'd absorbed when I really took that on board and was like, oh, yeah. Okay. I'm all for it. This will be fun. Rose, March 2005. Where were you? Uh, at home watching it, probably. I was in a caravan. It's not like, it's not like the death of Kennedy where you remember where you were when you heard it. I do. I don't. I do because th- there was something almost as memorable as the assassination of Kennedy. There was the assassination of uh, consistent broadcast quality. Oh, yeah. As, that was terrible, wasn't it? the show that Graham Norton was hosting either side of it live. Yeah. The audio bled in during the mannequins in the basement. Because this was, this was at a point where I still had a VHS uh, recorder. So I actually recorded the entire series on VHS so I could rewatch it before it came out on, v- on DVD. Beautiful. And yeah, um, so I did have the VH- I didn't have a VHS recording with the the sound bleed in the first 10 minutes or so with yeah. uh, from the Graham Norton. Uh, it was, was it Strictly? It wasn't Strictly, no. It was something like that. It was, it was, it was like Fame Academy or some yeah. show like that. Well, something that Graham Norton was presenting that was on just before it live and then the audio leaked in to the first oh, 10 minutes so of the broadcast. Weird. It was very... Very odd. There's one specific moment, and then there's sort of little noises that follow later on. The thing is, where it fits, it fits at the beginning where Rose is sort of in the the service tunnels underneath the department store, and it sort of fits. Well, uh, in the Rose novelization, Russell T Davies changes it to so there's some interference from a radio nearby. He oh, that's added good. It in, that's good. Um, which is pretty cool, and and uh, something like that. And then there's uh, when, when I did Time Team for Doctor Magazine, um, we're covering the modern era and. We would get together every now and again to watch a chunk of episodes, and the rest of the time we do it independently. But we got together to watch End of the World, uh, uh, Rose, End of the World, and The Unquiet Dead, and we did it at Tom Spilsbury's flat. And he brought out the DVDs, but for Rose, he brought out a VHS, oh. and we watched a taped copy of it, complete with the Graham Norton thing. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this, is like, this is like seven years later. It was, this is amazing. It should be a special feature on the Blu-ray, it really. It really should be. Um, I've not I've not dived into the Steelbook yet. I should probably have a little, optional, little gander through. <laughs> optional audio alternate. <laughs> so Rose. Mark has to do it. <laughs> Bloody wood. Let's talk Rose. Rose is great. Rose is great. I love it. I great love new companion. Great way to It's... It sort of set the, the sort of new tone of introducing the Doctor through the companion's point of view. And making the companion the main character. Yeah, and the audience surrogate. As, but the audience surrogate in a way where you see this crazy world through their eyes rather mm-hmm. than them just being the person who goes, but what's this, Doctor? But Doctor, what is this? Because as much as I love Joe Grant, that is kind of all she does. Until a later series where they sort well. of like, yeah, she's going to do her own thing. Um, but I know what you mean. Like that, that, is, that is the role... Of the companion, um, traditionally, yeah. is, is to be the audience surrogate in inquisitiveness alone. Um, and it was such a, a rare thing, really, for them to be given full-on backstories in the classic run. Like, some of them get to develop stories as time goes by. Eight, well, they did, we, they did it with Ace, yeah. most notably, because if you go back and watch that last season mm. of Classic Who, it feels like very much a early prototype of what the new series would come back as. I mean, Fenric, Ghostlight, and Survival, yeah. especially, it's just like, well, because oh, it's, wow. it's at a time when TV was starting to change. Yeah. Even serialised TV was was less episodic and more of an ongoing narrative. Plus, Doctor Who's um, main competition was, uh, in terms of UK broadcast, was Star Trek The Next Generation. Yeah. Which, you know, doesn't necessarily have a big overarching narrative season per season, but it has consistent character development mm. over seasons that that actually changes as opposed to it sort of resetting more or less to a status quo in between stories which is kind of where Doctor Who had been up to that point yeah. for the most part it it, it it was a put the toys back in the box at the end of each story kind of show yeah kind of um, with only minimal development between cast changing really um so it, it's, it was nice for this to be like, yeah, no, we're going to start with, not only is the companion going to be our our window into the story, but you're going to learn everything about their life at this current moment before we even start the sci-fi story. Before that even begins, you're going to yeah. know Rose inside and out and you're going to get a sense of who she is. And it's all told through montage as well. It's not like fully scripted scenes. It's this really well cut, like, you know, to that brilliant Murray Gold music that occupied that era. Yeah. You just kick off with that do 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 
I hear that now and I just get really excited because I'm like, oh, we're watching series one. Uh, it's because so you're, it's you're a, a strange person. True. What? It's not like I did a 27 episode long podcast on no. series one of Doctor Who. No, 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 no. Which if you scroll down this feed, you'll find it at the bottom. Oh, God. <laughs> not that weird. Uh. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So uh, Rose is great. The Doctor is the most stripped down version of the character Absolutely. visually we've ever had. You don't try and you don't do what they did in the TV movie where they do the oh it's they have the opening narration and a lot of backstory dumped on you. It's you act, you get it through this not even through this episode through the series. Yeah, it's like we learn more. It and more. eases you into it. End of the world gives us the yeah. most kind of oh. Oh, that's where he is. Yeah, now. they sort of take a little bit of time and, to sort of establish then, the new status yeah, quo for this character. Little bits dribble through after that. Um, the notion that worlds have been lost or destroyed in some kind of conflict, and you begin to realise, oh, he feels responsible. Oh, is he? Oh, yeah. And then you get to Dalek at the mid season, which set a trend for this era of who as well at the the middle series story, where a, se- a season of television normally would dip in viewership. They would try and make it through either a uh, character inclusion, a villain return, or just the title of the episode. Something yeah. that would make everyone go, wait, what? And tune in. Um, to varying degrees of success, but it works. Especially for Dalek, which is still, I think, probably the probably the best Dalek story. Um, in terms of at least encapsulating what makes them effective and, and, and where you can go with them. I mean, yeah, maybe. Maybe. Maybe second um, best, because I guess, I guess you're dealing with a Dalek that's against type in it. Yeah. Well, um, not really. <clears throat> against type in the sense that it's... Um, it begins to change and develop as the story goes on. Wait, only... We'll get to Dalek. Not, yeah, we'll get, we'll get to, to Dalek. Dalek but, yeah, um, but yeah, Rose is a really strong start. It, it does a simple sci-fi thing, uses a classic villain. Yeah, and, and uses, the, uses them the exact same way that we used the first time they were yep. used, which is... Dressing. It's a background to everything that's going on. And it just you know, doesn't spend too much time expositing. So it, you know, I think I think that was the strength of the show when it came back. It just it, it presented a very grounded opening story before taking you to the next uh very sci fi heavy story. End of the world. Straight up far future Anus. Are we going to get you doing Murray Gold's greatest hits this whole two episodes? Only if I immediately hear the episode in my head. Oh, End of the world is fantastic. I apologise um, in advance, ladies it, and gentlemen. It's, it's the it's the uh, the, the, the aristocratical aristocratic uh, get together storyline of them all yeah. watching something because they're rich and they have the position to do it, but it's, they're watching the Earth die in the year five billion. Yeah, it's a murder mystery. At, uh, let's all go and watch the Earl Earl the Earl all, all go and watch the world burn party. And sort of Rose trying to get her head around being able to time travel. Again, it slowly drip feeds you the, the, the Doctor's backstory and and uh, the new sort of, his new status quo and his, and his increased pathos. Yeah. Um, it really, um, it just sort of, it shows you that they're not afraid to go a bit weird with some of the creature designs. Oh my God. Um, yeah. And get all sci-fi on it, which is- From the Forest of Cheem. Because trees, trees. <laughs> actual like, trees. Yeah. Um, Jabe is a great character. All, as well. all before Groot was a household name. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mox of Balhoon. Um, the face of Bo. Yeah, the adherence of the repeated meme. <laughs> that's all, that's all, all it is. Repeat meme. It's an idea. Yeah. Um, Cassandra, of course. Cassandra O'Brien uh, yeah. got Delta Seventeen. Wonderful. And again, getting like how like well known British guest stars right off the bat with Zoe Wanamaker. Zoe Wanamaker. Which would which would be continued uh, throughout the series, um, and she will come back as well, of course. She for, for bloody well pieces. will. She's not the only recurring cast member as well. Like oh, we only see her briefly in this one, but Camille Kajuri's Jackie is such a great. Yes, of course, to the because show. that's another thing that, that this series does differently that set that starts off in Rose is her family mm. and her having a supporting cast as opposed to just being. Um, a lot of the, the time, Doctor's companion. The, the only it, time that really happened prior was Ace. They started to tease it with, like, yeah, develop it a bit. But um, Joe, I guess, really, because Joe was so grounded within the unit that they kind of made well, it was part unit, of that era. But like, she was the only one who was like, "Oh, she has a home. Yeah. She goes home to." And the, the sort of the unit era was sort of its own sort of mini ensemble show. Yeah, because it would keep returning to this familiar supporting cast. 
But essentially, they're all expansions of the companion concept. Yeah. Like, um, I mean, some, some they give you backstory enough to make them, like, want to go with the Doctor. Like, Leela, it's sort of obvious why she goes with him. And, and, yeah. and uh, Nyssa, like, it's kind of obvious why she goes with him and things like that. But it's... But it's not obvious why she leaves. <clears throat> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Whereas with Rose, it's like, you, they're, set, they're set in tethers. There's an anchor. Yeah. And she wants more than this. But like, she doesn't classic want... Classic Disney princess. Yeah. But, you know, she... She doesn't want to leave behind. No, she's, she's not got. looking to 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 leave her old life. She's like she just... doesn't blame Mickey for the fact she's bored either. Like no, Mickey the stupid. She doesn't blame him. And again, Noel Clark, excellent turn as a as a as a, regu- as a recurring a supporting performer. In yeah, it. absolutely. Like she doesn't you know blame him. She still like has affection for him and and cares about him and visits him. Yeah, and, and it's yeah. You know, but but there's also no sense of like, oh no, you're definitely going to return me home every day, Doctor, which is a weird problem with the character later on. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, End of the World's wonderful. Murder Mystery's great. The spiders are creepy. And also, Russell T. Davies has a great touch for introducing little characters who we only meet for a scene or two, but you really like them. Yeah. He's... Which then ups the stakes when something horrible happens to them. Yeah. Like in this one, the, uh, the plumber. Oh yeah, she's just working on the thing, and it's and just she gets that, killed. It's, and that's almost didn't do. I was about to classic Doctor Who, which you take that time to establish a supporting character and then kill them off horribly. Yeah, Jabe, Jabe, Jabe. She's another one where it's yeah. like you really bloody like. Oh yeah, spoiler alert by the way for a fourteen-year-old <laughs> season of Doctor Who. Um, End of the world leads nicely to another sort of tradition of this era. Yeah, which is episode two and three interchangeable one goes to the far future and one goes to the, the recent past and if they go to the recent and if they go to the relatively recent past they'll meet a historical figure yeah in this case Mark Gates is the unquiet dead where they go to Cardiff and encounter ghosts ghosts uh, in Christmas psychic undertakers at Christmas with Charles Dickens of course because of course played wonderfully by Simon Callow oh my god this um, is, again another tradition they sort of do um, funnily enough a lot of them in the Mark episodes where they get actors who've portrayed these historical figures before like Simon Callow's got like a one man show about Charles Dickens well we, uh, we um, Ian McNeese later on like has done stuff as Churchill yes. already before he was cast as Churchill in, in Big and continued doing it for Big Finish because yeah. <laughs> of course he did um, <laughs> um, the jowliest man in television um <laughs> But he, uh, no, we we. Mr. Fa- Ventura, sorry, I found oh, myself. No, they're both in that. Yes, I just realized so, they're both in when they calls. Yeah. Uh, but we, I, I came across, um, <laughs> or my dad came across a, a Roald Dahl audio book collection yeah. at a charity shop that we 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 took and and we played some in the car when we had the little one recently. Yeah, and it's Simon Callow reads the twits in it. Oh, that's good casting. And it's so good. That's really good casting. It's so good. God damn, that's actually a great one. Um, <laughs> Callow is ace, and the ghost tries to get pity the gelf. Um, yeah, using like the iconography of, of stuff we associate with that era, ghost stories to create an alien yeah. presence. Um, and again, expanding on the time war idea, and Mister Sneed. And lovely Eve Miles playing Gwyneth. Yeah, who would la- who, and she would later return to to Torchwood as uh, Gwen, um, and then Doctor Who would subtly, uh, not so subtly, confirm that yeah, the two characters are related. There you go, people who are confused. <laughs> but really, it's just because they like the despite actors. the fact that throughout the entire classic yeah. run and now a lot of the more recent modern run, there have been actors in playing several yeah, parts with no explanation. Actors playing ha- are all the Michael Sheard characters in the classic one related. <laughs> No! It, to the point where it felt almost weird when Moffat tried to explain why the 12th Doctor had yeah. cursed his face. It was like, no, do you know what? We don't care. Just, it doesn't matter. Don't bother. Like He never explained why he, he had bloody um, Commander, Commander Maxwell's, Maxwell's face. face when he turned it to Colin Baker. So yeah. Don't worry about it. Just, it just not, it's not important, is it? Oh, no. We don't we need to got know. the face of that lady from Attack the Block. <laughs> why? Oh, no. Why is everybody Philip Maddox? Why are all the guest stars Philip Maddock? Julian Glover? Uh, again? Again? Uh, <laughs> more <laughs> Nicholas actually, Courtney? Actually, again. King Richard the Lionheart was one of Scaroth last of the Jaggeroth's time splinters. Is that a theory? No, prob- it's probably. A demon. A dancing it's, it's demon? definitely a theory. Oh, there's, God. De- there's definitely someone out there in a basement 
going, mm, I can connect all the guest stars into one unified theory of guest actors. Hey, let us not headcanon shame, all right? No, I, d- I don't mean to mock people who, you know, take uh, things too seriously. And let's not... Stop. Um, let's Please not, stop. Let's not fart shame either, because next up is the first two-parter of the modern era. The first excuse to have a flat-out cliffhanger. Yeah. Like the old days... I love Aliens of the London first, World The War first III. sort of showcase for the new series effects budget, which doesn't hold up at all, but oh, there's no. charm in those designs. Well, it's mostly because they, they saved the money for um, toward the end of the series. Yeah. They, had, they dropped an episode in budget and created Boomtown out of it, which means yeah. that all three of the Sladine episodes are kind of part of this compromise. But I love them. Because, yeah, big fat baby green aliens fitting into uh, disguises that fart because the compression of the gases like plays havoc with the insides yeah but also those disguises are the skin suits of the human victim they've yeah. killed and eaten the insides of not just that they've taken the time to craft a space zip on the head yeah like i know that's a daft concept yeah. and a fun visual but also that's sadistic as hell well it's it's weird going back to the <laughs> russell the, the rusty they crafted a skin suit with a zip <laughs> well, you gotta get in and out of it more- how do you got the bathroom? Um, <laughs> what you could... I'm shaking my booty. Oh, and that Badland is so good. She is having a whale of a She's time. So good. Um, but you, also it's... the first and only use, as far as I'm aware, to this day of the word bollocks in Doctor Who. It's the la- it's the nearly heard last word of the Slovene before the, uh, oh, the missile hits down. Oh yeah, the okay, okay. Oh bollocks. <laughs> well, that's in that's in the second part. That's in World War Three. Oh yeah, uh, but we're talking about both these episodes at the same time because it's, because it's beautiful. Um, the, cl- the cliffhanger is everyone getting electrocuted, Jackie about to be killed by a Slovene, and um, Harriet Jones witnessing uh, the murder of uh, uh, somebody in the cabinet room. Somebody's murder. Somebody, somebody gets murdered. murdered. Harriet Jones and me from Flydale North. <laughs> yes, we know you are. Yes, we know. Um, so it's... If you go back to the Russell T. Davis era, who now? What is strange about it compared to modern Who, or at least the the later Mo- the Capaldi Moffat era, is how much lighter it is in tone. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it's. It uh, is definitely more of a show for the family that was on at seven o'clock on Saturdays. Yes, yeah. Which it absolutely it got out of, and I think that was part of the why there's been a problem with the show finding a sort of a home on TV for the last few years is that it's not got it's gotten away from that. Very Family simple guy. identity. Yeah, it, it's it's sort of tried to become more. I mean, there was there was such an obvious thing of it trying to be a bit more games of Game of Thronesian in tone in places. Yeah, right down to them casting Game of Thrones actors and making a deal out of it. Yeah, almost as though to be like, see, yeah, we're like this. It's like, yeah, but you're about the daft clown alien in a blue box going to fight weird monsters. And like, I think I think and, got... and, and fan fanboy slash fangirl out over historical yeah. figures like that's. But I think they've that's got, what the show should be, and I think they've gotten back to that a bit. Yeah, with the latest with the latest series. Oh, thirty is such more, an innocent like. Uh, yeah, uh, um, it's got more of that sense of fun, but it's a, it's still a bit more sentimental. Yeah. Oh um, yeah, and it's got a bit more of an emotional punch. And, Not no, to say and, that these episodes the alien, don't. But and some of the aliens are getting more. back to that sort of dafter threats as well. Like the Slovene, yeah, as grim as they are when you think about them. Like, they are still these big baby things that yeah. the practical effect looks glorious, the CGI running one, not so much. Um, not bad, just obviously not the same as the suit. But they did it! Yeah, and then in Sarah Jane Adventures, when they bring they them back, because they were like, these aliens are great, but they're not going to play off as well because we've got sort of people moaning about them in the main show. So we're going to put them in Sarah Jane and use them to their full potential. Guess what? They're amazing in Sarah Jane, and at no point do they use CGI to make them run. They just have the suits run and shoot them better. And they, as a result, they look creepier. Because they're just Good. sort of like galloping up hallways. It's like, oh, this is really freaky. Like low angle shots and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, they also redesign them a bit and make them like darker green and they look really freaky. But uh, and we also get the Blatherine. One of them, voiced by Simon Callow. It all comes back. <laughs> all comes back together. It's almost but, like Rusty likes working with the same people. Yeah, well, in, a, in a way. And that's why um, a lot of his projects are so the consistent. Same, and using the same names. There's, yeah. a, there's a character in, I think it's uh, Sound of Drums, called Vivian Rook, and that is the name of Emma Thompson's uh, political character in Years and Years. Uh, okay. Uh, he uses Smith and Jones as surnames throughout his work, constantly. Mickey Smith, Martha Jones. Oh, why wouldn't you? Uh, no, but like, as a point, like to the point where when he hit, the only time he wrote for the 11th Doctor is Sarah Jane Adventures' Death of the Doctor, and Sarah Jane Smith meets the... 
uh, you know, the the, the, the the beloved companion Joe Grant, who of course got married to Professor Jones and is now Joe Jones. Sarah Jane Smith and Joe Jones. Yeah. Like, even in that stuff, it's like, he couldn't resist. He's like, oh yeah, she married, didn't she? We're going to call her Jones. Um, he's great. Uh, Family's work, in case you can't tell. But I love the Slovene and, and that... That tradition's nice when they do make a threat that's sort of cuddly and weird. Like the Pating in the recent year. Oh, the Pating was so cute! It's adorable, but also terrifying. terrifying yeah. When you think about what it's going to do to the ship you're in. It's like, oh, this is horrible. Um, but I love the Slovene. I love the introduction of Harriet Jones. Penelope Walton is amazing. Yeah. Um, the, the re-establishing of, of Mickey and Jackie. The classic era thing of the TARDIS not quite always being spot on. But also that... that... Like, I, I thought it was 12 hours, actually. Yeah, twelve months, and also the, the um the the consequences of that. Yeah, of what what that actually means for the family that Rosalie's behind. And again, it's the the unit thing of there are people now on Earth who are aware that he's out there. Yeah, and and have stakes in him and and his friend returning because you know she's Jackie's daughter. Yeah, she's she's um, Mickey's you know ex and one of his best friends, and it's like this is. Oh God! There's stakes now from not coming back, mm-hmm. uh, and the ending of this two part is wonderful. She, like horrible and heartbreaking, and brilliantly done. Where she's like, "I'll be back in," like, "I'll be back before you know it." Like, like three seconds for you, honestly. And the TARDIS disappears, and Jackie waits. She waits. She waits. They don't come back. Yeah. And the credits roll, and you're like, "Oh God, this is great." Leading us into episode six, the start of the mid series. Um, hey everybody, come back and watch this tradition. Dalek. This is the moment everyone was waiting for, really, wasn't it? Oh, God, yeah. Well, the moment they said the show's come back, it was like, right, so the Dalek's going to be in it. And behind yeah. the scenes, they weren't sure because the Terry Nation estate had circumstances and demands and parameters that they wanted being stuck to. Oh, Terry Nation! With them. A lot of them were financial. <laughs> with the, with the uh, transmission of re- resolution, do we think that that is actually a thing then? The I th- whole, the I th- whole th- nation th- contract. I think it exists. But not as black and white as as we know it to be. I yeah. think I think there has to be a level of usage. Look at look at how rights work out in a lot of the studio formats. Yeah, having like to that. having to use it x amount of times in a certain period before it reverts. And... Yeah, so I, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if there was something to do with it because the year that they weren't going to have a story series six, they still cameo. Yes. Um, the specials year where they aren't the focus of an episode, one of them cameos in the Waters of Mars. Yeah. Um. Series I can't remember now. Is it series ten didn't have a Dalek story, but they appear fighting the uh the is it, oh, who's it they're fighting? Is it the it's not the Dravin, is it? The Mavellans. The Mavellans at the start of um what do you call it? The start of uh the series ten the first in pilot. So they're in a scene. The year before when there was no full series, they showed a preview of that scene during a big sporting event. Yeah, it's like yeah. They, you know, so the Daleks were on screen when there was a lot of viewers, so and it's, you know, which would mean that anyone who owns them and wants to make money from them are like, well, oh yeah, we're that pleased was the... because you put them on during the World Cup. That was the famous was. debut of Asbill. Was it the World Cup or was it Wimbledon? It was World Cup. Wimbledon was Jody's review. Yeah, yeah. The year after, yeah, the Asbill. Oh God, the space incident. Per Mackey ended up actually being really good. Yeah, she was great. Um, so that'll teach us for mocking bad captions. <laughs> well, we still mock bad captions. Yeah, people have to proof watch things. You know what I mean? Like you, you listen back to or rewatch everything you've worked on to make sure it, it works. Wait, are you saying that there are some, not all, <laughs> but there are some people within the uh, marketing department for the BBC and its various dramas that aren't on the ball 100%? So, Dalek. Uh, <laughs> Dalek's really bloody good, and we're fans of its work. Rob Sherman's only script. To this day for the modern series and it was also it was like a sort of an adaptation of his big finish story jubilee wasn't jubilee, it yeah and it which is referenced briefly in the episode there's a pizza box with jubilee <laughs> and the name of the brand on it in the episodes so like, oh there we go um but it's the first time with the doctor is no longer kind of this you know he, he's not the stable guy who's, who's leading the story and making sure everything works out all right he goes off the rails and it takes rose's perspective to actually kind of yeah bring him back down to earth this is the this is the start of him becoming the doctor again yeah instead of this this man who's on the run from the horrible thing he's done and and things he's seen like he's about to he's about to do something even worse he's about to kill this Dalek. he's facing the things that he's done which which is you know yes it's gonna kill everyone on the planet 
and and stuff. But it's like he's no better than them if based on his entire thing to this point. If he kills it, yeah. and Rose manages to stop that from from happening and the turn happening. The Dalek gets some human DNA because Rose reactivates it by accident. Um, but yeah, they, they didn't know if they were going to have him. So a version of the script was written featuring what would eventually be reused in series three as the Toclophane. Yeah. Not the exact same concept, but the idea of this like Swiss army knife sentient weapon within a casing, a creature within a casing that was, you know. But I think if that had happened, we'd all would have loved it, but gone, that should have been a Dalek. Yeah. That should have been a Dalek. What's going on? That should have been a Dalek. So I'm glad it worked out, and it's definitely one of the best Dalek stories ever done. Yes, and it's brilliant. And because also, I am Henry Van Staten now recognise me. The the Daleks have become such a Salt Lake joke. Tree, Sacramento, someone starting with an S. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the Daleks have they're, become mean, they're, such in, a joke. they're in cigarette adverts yeah. and all this. Stuff. Everyone's like, oh, what they're gonna do when they find stairs? Because nobody watched. Um, uh, well, the sixties or Remembrance yeah. or or ever looked at any image of them ever on a flying no. thing or hovering. No. Um but, but anyone who didn't but, know Doctor Who was like, oh, what they gotta do when they come against up a flight of stairs, you just where, push them down. <laughs> to the point where they give Bruno Langley just that exact line of dialogue. Yeah. Sc- was it scariest thing in the universe defeated by a flight of stairs? And it just looks up and goes, Elevate. Yeah. And just starts to lift. You're like, oh that's terrifying yeah so cool and because it knows that it you just know that under its case it's like <laughs> dick it's fucking with him yeah <laughs> i'm coming for you it's, it's, it's a vindictive dalek it's a vindalek yeah it's a vin diesel <laughs> this dalek's all about family um i love it i think it's brilliant i think the redesign of them's fantastic and it re-establishes them as a threat daleks are still a threat plus we get to see a dalek mutant in full glory for the first time oh, ever really. a new lovely redesigned dalek mutant um because before this they've just been like kidneys with stringy bits or, yeah or a claw coming out of, out of the darkness or just or a little bit of a little bit of a hand coming out from under a cloak <laughs> <laughs> like a rubber glove painted green or something. yeah um, um i love the <laughs> i got the genesis of the daleks toy set when it came out in like 2010 yeah and it comes with you know fourth doctor two daleks davros and a dalek mutant oh it's, it's just basically some stringy stuff with a brown lump in the middle Pardon me you put, put it around his put it around hold, tom's neck oh no ah, help ah, me ah, Howdy! Sullivan, there's an embassy. Uh, um, yes, that's so brilliant. Yeah. Uh, love Dalek. It is so good. And gives us Adam, a character played by Bruno Langley. Yeah, you know, our, sort of goes, our second new series companion. Yeah, everyone always goes, Adam, who's Adam? Is a stupid character. What was the point in Adam? The point in Adam is very evident when you watch the long game. Yes. No, he, episode. he is stupid. Yeah. But he's not a stupid character. Yeah. He is Russell T. Davies' way of showing that not everybody is right for this. <laughs> No. Which they've never really done before, have they? Like, uh, in this classic run, there's never really a story of, like, this person's going to go with him. Oh, but they no, screw up. Is never there, mind. Uh, yeah, has the ever sort of... Has the ever sort of left um, a companion a companion left acrimoniously? No. Like, the Doctor sort of left someone behind or just kicked someone out? No. This is it. This is, like, the get out, you little shit <laughs> sort of thing. Um, in an episode that, again, without realising it, when you first watch it, is establishing stuff that will come to play later on in the series. Yeah, because but people started noticing the bad wolf thing by now. Uh, not obvious. I think some people have been picking up on it, but this was like the days before Twitter and stuff, so it was only yeah. like playground and and because and this chatter. is back in the time when I was still active on Outpost Gallifrey slash Gallifrey Base, whatever it was called at that point. I think it was still Outpost Gallifrey at that point. Um, I'm post Gallifrey. Yeah, so I remember there being a whole bad wolf thing, but I, I think it was around this point that people started picking up on it. That it was a, it was a recurring theme. But yeah, like, the game station. Um, that's not the game station. Yeah, it's Satellite Five. It's yeah. a broadcaster. Um, broadcasting news and all everything that's been beamed down to earth is being done from here. You can have a Kronk burger, enjoy yourself. Uh, info spikes in y'all's head. Info spikes in y'all's noggin. Um, and and the editor and the mighty Jagrafess of the Holy Hadrogesic Max Arodenfo. <laughs> I call again, him Max. Russell T. Davis being Russell T. Davis. Simon Pegg guest starring. Tamsin Greer guest starring. Yes. Oh, she's um, so good, isn't it? Yeah, it's... Uh, it's, it's a, a real, cracking story. It's really eerie. It's really good fun. And it's very... Um, you know, it's it's big brother uh, big brother esque in terms of the idea of like, oh, this is how information is filtered, yeah, uh, and all this stuff, which then they take to a very literal and also another type of big brother thing later on. Yes, um, it's a, it's a great story, but it ultimately serves to be like, yeah, Adams 
a dick and reckless and irresponsible yeah. and he, he let he let his selfishness get in the way of the fact that he really shouldn't be here. It's a privilege to do this. Yeah. Like, interfering. You well, he, do. He, and, he, and it's a great cliffhanger because it's so, like, he's left there with the info spike in his head and then his mum clicks her fingers when she sees him and screws him over. Mm-hmm. And, and never, got, never got followed up on in the show. But if you're curious as to what happened to Adam next, go and give the... Um, I think it's called Lost in Time. The, the 50th anniversary uh, big crossover event comic. Go give that a read, folks, because that story also touches on what happened next for Abby. <laughs> um, in a way where you're like, yeah, I yeah, I buy this. I completely buy this. This is a great idea. Um, so, yeah, what is next after the long game? Next two part. Oh, God, we're straight into um, uh, Empty Child and Doctor Dancers. No. Father's Day. Oh. Father's Day. Holy oh, shit. Oh, yeah. Paul Cornell makes his debut with the modern series, giving us Pete Tyler and a story that actually, for once, touches on the ideas of so here's what happens if you change something, not only in your personal history, but something that needed to happen. Like, this is the story that starts to make clear the new series established rules of fixed points in time. And um, what's the other? What do they call the other ones? It's like the, 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 there's, there's, bit, there's bits of time where it is malleable and things can change yeah. because the ripples don't affect anything too vastly in terms of like well, the, they do, the way the universe is. They set do keep out going to back go. to that concept of fixed points in history. Yeah, but <laughs> this is this is the first one to sort of show you like yeah. what can happen if you screw with it. Uh, but it's also a case of oh, I think. it's also a case of. Those rules are as malleable as the person writing the story, so it's yeah, not. It all, it all they, on who. They're, they're, they introduce the concept, but they're not necessarily consistent with it throughout the se- the following series. Because this story introduces the Reavers, uh, sorry, the Reapers. Yes, the Reapers, Reapers, Reapers. Reapers. Uh, which are these horrible beasts that live outside of our dimension and can only get through from the time vortex if things are screwed up and, and time starts to get uh, sort of the barriers of, of the linear time as it was start to break. There's a and wound in time and they're here to clean it. That's the one. And they they apparently were held back by the Time Lords in the days of yore. Yes. But not anymore. And uh, as a result, they're going to kill everybody. Yeah. And eat them to cleanse the wound. But because of the Time Lords... They're the well, Lion they sort of, but better designed. Yeah. Well, they sort of imply that like they've always been allowed to do this. Yeah. But then the Time Lords have cut it off before it gets to things. It's like the Time Lords have, as we know yeah, in the they classic sort of series... they they shepherded it rather yeah. than just letting it... It's like, yes, we'll let oh, them get in there course. and devour certain things, but then we'll stop it and cut it off there. And we'll fix the rest. Yeah. Whereas now, without being kept in check, they're just going to keep devouring all of existence and all of reality person by person. Because, you know, um, if, you, if you're given a smorgasbord and no limit, you're just going to eat it all, aren't you? Pretty much. And it's very Why Stephen not? King as well. Like, Stephen Langle is in that, like, places of holy belief and this and the other things that are older than a lot of recorded time and whatnot yeah our sanctuaries like they can't get into the church at first they just physically cannot get in because it's it's so it's steeped in like belief and history and all this stuff it's, it's just old it's old as balls and they mm. can't break through it unless they have a connection that connection ends up being rose touching the younger version of herself by holding the baby great idea jackie's 80s hair brilliant uh who plays pete tyler uh what's his name is it sean something i think so like, give me a sec. Because he's absolutely phenomenal. Da, 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 da. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. But he's wonderful. And the moment of realisation when he sees the car spinning around outside, like, you can tell time is trying to correct itself in some way. Because the car that knocked him over... Sean Dingwall. Uh, the car that knocked him over has repositioned itself to outside of the church and keeps swerving. The driver seems like he's going to hit something and then it disappears. And he, he puts the pieces together and realises what he has to do to basically make sure that his daughter lives and life goes on. It's like, oh my God, this is nuts. And just creepy. The first time the series feels like it's in true peril because the doctor gets devoured and is gone. Yeah. And it's up to not even Rose. Rose can't do anything. And Pete does it. Making, takes it his hand. making the sacrifice play. Going into the the thing that the doctor does in that episode, we're talking about the married couple and everything. Like, 
ordinary, like, is the most wonderful thing ever. Like, yeah. he, he's never had that. He's never had what they're going to have, and he wishes he could. It's a and show. It's amazing. And an and ordinary man saves the day. It sa- saves the universe. These first couple of Rusty series are almost completely without cynicism. And it's wonderful. Mm. It's wonderful. Beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. Now, speaking of cynicism, Moffat rocks up. Yep. For his first two-parter. Yep. Uh, say what you want and think what you want about Stephen Muffiat, but I think it's it's sort of unanimous on our side that yeah. we're not too keen on a lot of his choices in his era as the showrunner. No. But we really like his stories this is where he gets during his, this era. Yeah, this is where he gets his feet under the table as the scary Doctor Who writer. Yes. Uh, Empty Child and the Doctor Dances, World War Two, Gas Mask Zombies, yeah. Injuries as Plague, um, Are You My Mummy, The Blitz. Victor Meldrew turning into a gas mask zombie. Yeah. <laughs> Squareness Gun, the, uh, <laughs> the Weapon Factories of Villain Guard. They grow bananas there now. Bananas yeah. are good. Um, and Captain Jack Harkness, a character co-created by Moffat and Russell. Um, Who... Again, will pop up. Not only does he join the Tidus crew in this story, he'll become but our third up. regular companion of the series. But pops up again and again and again and again, and even gets his own spin-off show because that was the thing that happened in the Rusty era was the spin-off show. Yeah, it Avengers. Which we're not really going really to touch Avengers before the here. Avengers. Yeah, we'll do that another day. Um, but because uh, then yeah. I have to watch so much for another one. To be honest. Um, Cam Jack's wonderful. Yes, and he's a great addition. John Barrowman just being all John Barrowman charm and smile and flash. And, and, and the first like. Uh, openly non uh, strictly heterosexual character in the show openly pansexual yes as he put it one day anything with a postcode Ugh. is how he worded it in an interview um, <laughs> which is great he's um, an equal opportunity seduction artist yeah but and, and they're very open with it he's, he's one of the first very openly sexual characters in the show as mm-hmm. well because um, he's he's a, he's a suave con man. He travels throughout time, fleeces people, sells rotten shit. Because he used to be a time agent. Again, they leave that open. They never really explain what that is. Yeah, it takes till series two of Torchwood before they even begin to expand on what that might be. Mm-hmm. Um, which is fine because in Doctor Who, you buy like, oh, so yeah. he's a guy who can sort of crudely travel through time for an organization that deals in that. Yeah, okay, you just need a cool. name. Yeah, there's a time agent there, and he was a time agent. That's kind of all you need. Yeah, that's all. All it takes, and a cool accessory wristband yeah. thing that you can sell the kids. If it was actually pertinent to the story, then you want to go into it. But it's not really, is it? No, it's, it's just, just flavor. A thing. It's just it's, it's tasty flavor. flavor. Uh, the gas mask zombies are haunting. Yep. Nancy is a great character. It's very yep. Oliver vibes with that group as well. Um, the revelation of of the kid brother actually being her son. Yeah. And the ending, it's one of the most memorable things in all of modern Who. Again, just this once, a show everybody without, lives. A show without cynicism. Problem is, it becomes a trait it's later, though. So it? positive. It becomes a trait later yeah. of, of that writer's era, the idea of death never being permanent. But in this story, it's so effective. I don't know. It's 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 more. It's more a thing. The, the whole reversal of death constantly tends to be a, a more of a thing in the Moffat era. Oh, I think but it's it's in his it's in his Russell era too. Yeah. Um, I think he is tends to be better which, at making which it. Which you stick. can find all, out all about in uh, an excellently written uh, 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 Five Who Fans video called Stephen Moffat's Greatest Fear, uh, which uh, was some handsome man put together. Um, well, Billy. Uh, not no. John. No no. Dan. No no. Phoenix. No. No. Oh. Who. <laughs> Doctor Who, that's who. Um, love Empty Child, Doctor Dances, and it leads into one of my favourite episodes of the modern series ever because I admire how the hell they managed to pull it off. Boomtown, which exists because they had no money. But it's also great because it's this <laughs> here's this high concept show with an episode that has a minimum amount of high concept stuff in it, but it worked, it's compelling, because it's actually taken the time to make you like all these characters, even the villain, who's a character from a previous story, but because the performance is so compelling, and the actress Im- actually imbues that character with some sense of of uh, heart mm-hmm. and personality, you can get away with a scene which is just her and the Doctor sniping each other over dinner. It's brilliant! Steak and chips. Lovely. <laughs> um, <laughs> Annette Badland is, is a gift. Oh, she's, and she's wonderful. so good in this. She is wonderful. Um, 
Uh, some great practical effects. Sets up a thing that is used for years after in both the main show and Torchwood. The Rift in Cardiff, yep. which, unbeknownst to us prior to this episode, was actually set up in The Unquiet Dead. Yeah. And this is spinning out of it. Uh, which is how you do story arcs without do, making them heavy-handed. But you tie in things in your series so people can go, oh yeah, from the other week. There's yeah. very much a sense, not so much when you first watched it, but when you go back to it, uh, that Russell was building a universe and building connections yeah. that he could then use for future stories. Absolutely. And even future spin-offs, <clears throat> which he did. Also gave birth to one of the most used GIFs on British side of Twitter in forever, which is of John Barrowman going, whatever. <laughs> Um, Mickey comes back we finally sort of get to learn a bit more about him from his point of view after yeah. having learned what he dealt with being blamed for Rose's disappearance poor Mickey um, we learn that Rose be... is a bit of a selfish get as well in this yeah. one just a little bit Trisha Delaney um, I don't even like her um, which is right because it's like oh yeah Rose is 19 like she's yeah. not really grown up grown up yet she's still she was definitely ahead of her time but, like, she's still a bit of a strobby teenager. She's still living in the clouds a little bit. Um, and she's not thought, really, about Mickey and what she left behind and what it meant to him no. for her to vanish from his from his life. She's too busy being off off with her two space boyfriends. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Um, I, can't remember what it, I can't remember what the random rhyme they end up doing is. It's like, oh. off into time and, and space. space. It's like, look at you lot. Pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> You are. Do you know how insufferable you are? But is, um, that, is that sense that when when Mickey comes back, Mickey comes in, it is they have been on so many adventures between the Doctor Dances and Boomtown. Boomtown. They just they have just become insufferable. They're in their own little bubble, which is expanded on in uh, Kevin Scott's Titan Run, yes. the ninth com- the ninth Doctor comics, which is set between those two stories. But it, it, it and just... the book, the monsters inside as well, because they. Oh no, hang on, that's that's set pre Jack, but yeah. they reference that in Boomtown. They reference one of the BBC yes. books in Boomtown, just to see her, and uh, and and they talk about woman wept and all these things. It's like, oh my god! So those books that we can get for a relatively decent price of like five ninety nine each, we could read those some as the them, series is some going of them on. Were not bad. I didn't read all of them, but I read a, I read uh, I read four or five. Pretty decent. I, I enjoyed them a lot. Great. That was a while. Was enjoyed, after that first wave, that was what I don't like. I enjoyed the Tenth Doctor ones set during the special year. They're really good. Oh, okay. uh, Autonomy is a pretty good one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, Boomtown's great. Annette Badman is wonderful. And again, it sets up one last thing for the end of the series. The idea that you can get through to the heart of the TARDIS. Yes. Like the TARDIS retaliates being attacked. And, and basically, like we assume shows um, Margaret slash Blonde all of time. Yeah, and everything, and just kind of regresses her, and it's like, oh my god, that's pretty terrifying. It's got it's like, sen- so, yeah. so the TARDIS is sentient in some way, which is hinted at a lot in the original run, and has a, you know, has a sort of defense mechanism. It's a, it's, it's got a power source which is basically magical. Yeah, because it's a kids show, guys. Get over it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, but that's the last setup before we head into the two parter, Bad Wolf, Part of the Ways. To this day, probably still my favorite finale of the show. Because the stakes are legit terrifying. Five episodes prior, we were introduced to one Dalek and saw what it could do. Now we're surrounded by tens of All thousands of them! Of them. Um, Including a big old Dalek Emperor who's oh gone God, yeah. proper around the who's twist. He's gone absolutely mental, has learnt religion, has claimed it as the god of all Daleks, and is creating Daleks from um, bits of the humans in the game station. The yeah. Net Satellite 5, like... I think it's like, is it 100 years later? The idea is uh, the stuff that, that the Doctor did that shook shook the foundations of it in long game led to other people coming in and taking control and it turns out that it's the Daleks leading humanity into yeah. sort of like a, a semi-docile state of just watching shit TV. Having the satellite that sort of just tran- transmits deadly versions of... Uh, what not to wear to and game shows and stuff. Big Brother. It's like, and so it's you know it's, weakest it's, link. It's it's aged in that sense with yeah. that with those references. But it, it, it I, I but know, going I out it was great. If a because... kid watched them now, not really having any knowledge of those shows, if a kid watched it now, would they just assume they were futuristic game shows? Yeah, probably. Is there enough of a disconnect now that they've come back around? Because it what wait, that's what made it work so well on transmission was that it was. Actually, referencing current events yeah. and current trends, which was what, which and it 
just helped ground the show in pop culture in a way that it hadn't been for so long because, you know, it had been off the air. And even when it was on the air, it got in the odd guest star here and there, a bit of stunt casting, but it never got too deep into leveraging what else was going on in the world at the time outside of, you know, broad political allegory here and there. Also, first appearance of Patson Joseph. Yeah. Who, to this day, always comes up when people go, so who should play the next Doctor? Love Patson um, Joseph. He's great. And uh, it's just a great story. Great cliffhangers, great stakes. <clears throat> the Dalek reveal at end of episode, end of episode one is fantastic. Um, the cliffhanger's great. Rose, the entire speech in the cafe when the TARDIS sends her back, like the Doctor tricks her into being sent back yeah. home. And, the, you know, uh, someone emailed, uh, emailed us about it not, not too long ago. The, 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 the actual hologram moment. It's heartbreaking. It's wonderful, it's Actually, it? you know, Eccleston getting to bring his chops. Bring out and, them um, chops. Them, them northern chops. <laughs> and really... Uh, by the way, if you hear a low rumble on, uh, on listening to this, it's just my cat kneading the blanket that it, we're sat on. <laughs> He's, God, he's uh, going for it. He's, yeah, he's making bread. Um, what, did, what did you think of Parting of the Ways? That's what I, he thought of it. I, I think yeah. that's approval. Yeah. That's a good one. It's, it's definitely it's thumbs up, if you had thumbs. Um, um, so, so yeah. Um, <laughs> love it. I love the entire thing in the, in the cafe about, like, it's th- hundreds of million years away. And she's like, no, it's now. It's yeah. happening now. And it's just all that stuff. The fact that she fight, she basically, like, vandalizes the TARDIS to get back to him. Yeah, and obviously the TARDIS realizes. Yep, and Bad Wolf scattered throughout time. It was a warning. It it was them trying to. It was sort of breadcrumbs trying to lead them to this point and yeah. what she needs to do, and she she put them there. She is the big bad wolf, um, which again, which comes upon the trend of Rusty hinting at what's coming throughout the season. <clears throat> yeah, which uh, Moffat tries to emulate and then gives up on. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't quite have the same. <laughs> but uh, Rusty did it right, very well, uh, I thought. Subtle story arcs. Yes. That aren't even really story um, arcs. They're just a lovely thing for a weekly viewers to keep track of and go, oh, uh, oh, that. Uh, love it. Start of the smooch as well. The smooch became a tradition. Yeah, love a smooch. Kind of works here. A lot of people didn't at the time. Yeah. A lot of people still don't. But I'm down with it. I think it works here. I think it's wonderful. It's 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 It doesn't... With these two versions of the character, with this version of the Doctor and Rose, it doesn't feel like a sexual thing. It's, it's romantic in a way, but I think it's more of a smooch of liberation. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's a thank you, which they set up. Like, he's doing it to save a life. They have to physically make contact, I assume, but like... Oh, yeah, sure. It, it's, oh, no, sure. But, oh, no. Like, yeah. it only happens because it's can't written that way. They can just hold hands. It only happens because it's written that way, but, like, yeah. they, but they sort of... Tonally, that is set up nicely earlier in the episode when Jack thanks them both and ultimately is assuming he's going to die so he says goodbye to them mm. he just gives them a massive kiss like there's nothing sexual about it well there's a little it's jack there's something a little bit sexual about it not the way they play it though like it's, it's no it's played, played it's played purely from an emotional point of view but so, it's, so, it's so i so i kind of buy that with i kind of buy that that was set as a seed for this moment toward the end yeah the next doctor however it's absolutely from a plutonic yeah sexual um, so consensual snog me handsome boy kind of thing we get David Tennant going straight into uh, Christmas Invasion <clears throat> yeah buy Eccles Cake um, Hallow Tenoyent um, and start just, another tradition the Christmas special yeah which I still think this is the best one because it's simple um, it's present day set so the Christmas thing is just yeah it's happening at Christmas it's Christmas well, yeah, 2006 in that so story. many of them have been so bad they're Particularly during the Moffat era, that I'm, I'm, I find it hard pressed to disagree with you there. But it, it's simple. There's evil Santas. There's evil um, Santas with uh, explode with rocket launching uh, brass band instruments. Yeah, there's the Sikorax. Uh, killer Christmas tree. Yeah, uh, Sikorax rock. Sikorax um, rock. There's, there's, there's blood <laughs> magic. Uh, what, was uh, it, what was it? Um, uh, blood control. Blood control. Blood control. Of course. A big red threatening button, which was never ever ever be pressed. Look at these people. The day they arrive on the planet, <laughs> blinking. Oh no! Step into the. No. Oh wait, no. That's a lion king. So yeah, immediately. <laughs> uh, even though he spends half the episode comatose, as soon as he wakes up, David Tennant putting his stamp on the character. Yes. This sort of manic, manic post regeneration, which is something that was kind of fun in the in the 
classic era and that this really indulges in it by taking him, like you say, out of action for the majority yeah. of the story. Rose has to deal with it herself with a little help from Harriet Jones, former MP for Flydale North, now Prime Minister. Yeah, we know who you are. Uh, second mention of Torchwood as well. Yeah. Torchwood's mentioned in The Weakest Link and then it's mentioned here. Torchwood are going to... Torchwood are the ones, presumably Torchwood one, who do the missiles. Yeah. Attack the correct ship. Sword fight, this hand, it's a fighting hand. Um, um, the Arthur Dent reference. Yeah. Uh, Satsuma. <laughs> um, <laughs> this, this, it works. It really works. And again, it relies on the strength uh, of, of Camille Kajori, Noel Clark, and Billy Piper to say to the kids watching, hey, hey, we know he's changed and he's not well, but things are going to be okay. Yeah. And at the end, they absolutely are. Starts the tradition as well of the Christmas specials having snow that isn't snow. <laughs> Just the, the ash of the Sycorax ship falling oh, out of the atmosphere. Yay. Um, cute. It's bloody great. I love the Sycorax. I love the design. I love the fact that they call back to it in Shakespeare Code. Yeah. It's so good. Um, new Earth! Or new, 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 new Earth. Um, <laughs> well, I missed out a couple. Uh, the first sequel episode. Yes. Sort of. I guess Bad Wolf Party of the Way is a sort of sequel to Dalek, but like, but yeah, this is Cassandra, uh, a new Earth, the year five billion and one. Um, <laughs> uh, new, 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 new York, um, and it's just it's a comedy caper. It's it's probably one of the weakest series openers, um, but I yeah, kind of, but I kind of I, don't I know kind about of that. consider the box set order. To be the right order, so Christmas Invasion's sort of the series opener, really. This this yeah. one more of a hey, here's the new guys, aren't they fun? Let's have a good time. Yeah, um, I can see that. I can see the argument for that. Bit of, bit of humanity for Cassandra, bit of backstory. Yes. So we want to make it gets to appear on camera. Yes. David and Billy get to show off their comedy chops as they uh, as they uh, play. Uh, Zoe Wanamaker's character yeah. like himself establishes the differences in their relationships yeah we get the snog for this season oh and cat nuns and cat nuns who doesn't like cat the nuns the sisters of plenitude god he's good with names <laughs> isn't he? um, zombies that are cured in a ridiculous way but it's a kid's show so cured by magic it. hugs magic hugs and, and a cocktail of medicine um, followed up by one of the best historicals of this run Tooth and Claw. Tooth, I love Tooth and Claw. Tooth and Claw is so Absolutely good. Absolutely love it. Queen Victoria. Um, the, yeah, the running gag of trying to get her to say a famous catchphrase. The, the running gag of, of, of a companion attempting a voice or slang in the doctor. Yeah. No, 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 no. Don't, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> David Tennant getting to show off his natural Scottish accent. Yeah, which impressed so many people because they didn't like, realise oh, that's so his voice, guys. No, he's that's Scottish. That's his actual voice. Um, um, the Dungaree outfit, which is adorable. And my favourite look for Rose, and I was so annoyed we never got an action figure of that. Oh, and don't and don't forget, a fucking werewolf in this. Yes. It's a werewolf story, a werewolf by the way. Has aged a little by today's standards, but that looked fucking excellent. So I, think the, that, I think that is the first like fully CGI big baddie that we'd had up a, to that point. Like think got like the Jagra Fest or, or Cassandra, where it's partial CGI and stuff like that, but. This is a full-on CGI werewolf. This is a, this is a slightly... and the Tardisodes, the Tardisodes showing that, that that guy getting infected on the moors and all this stuff. This is a, and the, the 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 monks, the kung fu monks, the yes. Scottish kung fu monks. It's so silly. It's not a it's not a what? it's not a werewolf. It's a lupine wavelength hemavera form. Oh, okay, sure, sure, sure. It's fucking werewolf. Because Russell loves his words. He loves it. He um, loves long words. Mistletoe and, and diamonds and and <sighs> and oh god, it's it's Albert. Like Albert's passing and forming the story, but also the idea that at the end of it, Queen Victoria's like, right, yeah, you helped save the day, but you are dangerous, and I'm not having any of your bullshit. You're banished from Earth, as far as she's concerned, and yeah. we're going to set up an institute to monitor stuff like this and stop you from coming back. Obviously, they didn't do a good job for many years. But yeah, the Torchwood Institute is set up. Well, it begs the question, doesn't it? What? Was Torchwood always there in his past adventures, or is it put there retroactively after it? Well, but you know, the show's about time travel, so it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah, with the with with <laughs> Von Hartman at the end of the series, we find out that yes, they've been monitoring him ever since, but they've never like pinned him down. Yeah, but have they though? <clears throat> yes. No, no, but have they? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't think you get what I'm saying, Chris. Have they? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> School reunion. <laughs> The shows, the shows. Aside from obviously lip service of Daleks and Autons, like 
and the Cyberman head in Dalek and things like that. Um, this is the show's first straight up harkening back to its classic era. Oh yeah, this is uh, nostalgia at its most, but with a story most bare face, but really. with a story purpose in the present. Well... Like the story is, hey Rose, you think this is amazing? Like you stuck with him two different faces you've stuck with him he's kept you around but what happens if this doesn't go on forever like what happens if one day he leaves you behind for some reason and or, he will or doesn't allow you to come back because he's a bummer because here's someone else who also spent time with two different versions of the doctor and thought it would go on forever and never did and ever yeah. since has been looking for him um sarah jane smith reprising the role of course elizabeth sladen and john leeson reprising the role of K9. <sighs> Just confirming once again that no, the five doctors did not deceive you. K9 uh, and company uh, is canon. It is canon. Um, um, Mickey uh, Smith it's... again. Anthony Stewart head as an absolutely delicious villain. Just um, chewing that scenery. Head and of, this wasn't that long head after the Cruelty finished, right? Uh, yeah, to, uh, 2006. So Buffy had finished three years prior? Yeah. Yeah. So, so he, he hadn't been very Mer- Mer- Merlin, much in the public eyes. Merlin then. was about to start, I think. So oh, okay, six, yeah. Seven was when Merlin rocked up. Okay. So, um, yeah, like he, he, it was, it was a good get. And I remember when it was announced that he was going to be in it, everyone sort of was like, "Oh, is he the master?" And I remember hearing that and going, "I kind of hope so." Oh, especially because he was in in <laughs> in pre-release, um, like uh, information. He was carried as headmaster. Yeah. So everyone went, "Ah, he's the." Anthony Headmaster. Ah. It's like, no, he was the headmaster of a school. He is kind of the first, like, formidable new foe as well. Yeah, like, that, is that scene in the swimming pool where they're sort of feeling each other out? <laughs> By the swimming pool. Threats. Them feeling each other out in the swimming pool is a completely different script. Yeah, that's in my erotic fan fiction. Ah, uh, headcanon. Uh, <laughs> oh, Don't polishes. headcanon shame. Don't do it, Polishes Polish his headcanon. Uh, Anthony <laughs> Oh <laughs> terrible <laughs> terrible if Giles were here he'd be cleaning he'd his glasses he'd be my head master oh <laughs> he'd be oh. cleaning his, he'd be cleaning his glasses and, and Wesley would be rubbing his knees running to watch oh good lord because he's a big pervert he is he is I, we were, uh, well we were watched that uh, some of that some of season 3 while we were painting the room and stuff and I had completely forgotten how much of Wesley's early episodes were spent lusting after Cornelia <laughs> yes Yes, which is, if I remember correctly, in Angel Series 1 is just kind of acknowledged with like a, yeah. hi, 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 awkward nod, let's move on. <laughs> and, well, also the, uh, that episode <laughs> where Buffy can read everyone's mind. Yeah, oh it's god, just yeah. Him. Jesus. Well, Wesley, yeah. Wesley's pure caricature in that first, that but, first series. But we're not here to talk about Alexis Denisov, we're here to talk yes, about... Yes, we are. Let, this is the Alexis Denisov episode, guys. Spoiler alert, we've changed. The um, Alexis Denisov power hour. To um, challenge Earth is to court death. Uh, so... Um, ah. true story uh, it's great I love School Reunion so much the idea of like two because compa- I think this was the first time aside from like the five Doctors and the two Doctors yeah. where like companions from the previous era met well it, again because we've got this more um, character driven feel to the show it's the first story where the companions have actually faced the implications of what happens after they leave the Doctor what They've got the Doctor moving on after them. Yeah. Uh, for both, um, from both perspectives, from the perspective of, of a past companion and a, and a present companion. Uh, so it was kind of... It feel, A lot of the, this Russell T. Davis era feels like stuff the fans of the show have been thinking about for years that had kind of been explored in the new adventures actually getting put on TV. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think there is very much a through line you can draw from... The ending of the of the of the original series through the new adventures of BBC books, which you know veered wildly from being too try hard, be mature to actual you know mature fiction. Yeah, um, and let us not forget, Russell T Davis did write a uh, new adventure, um, and then just going and sort of settling on a tone that that then gets. In that gets into a groove in the TV show when yeah. it returns, and I think there's definitely a, a lineage there, of, of because a lot of the people who would then later to come on to resurrect the show were fans of it, and they had had these ideas and thoughts and oh what if this and what if this, so they could actually develop them. For example, what if the Doctor legit fell in love, which is explored in the next episode. 
The Girl, Girl in the Fireplace, Fireplace by Stephen Moffat. Again, another excellent script, but sort of that idea of, oh yeah, that's something people have always go, no, 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 never do that. Oh, the kiss no. of the TV movie, you know, bullshit, bullshit, it's nonsense. It's like, yeah, in this, he legit falls in love. Legit falls in love with fucking Madame de Pompadour. Yeah. Because um, why not? <laughs> which in real life led to them being in a relationship as well for yes. a couple of years. So, Sophia Miles you know, and uh, David Tennant were an item for a while. Like, well, indeed he do. And and it, it works, like, I know it sounds weird, but like that chemistry works very well within the context of this story I being see, told. Because you does to- when you get people like coupling up on set and stuff. You totally buy it when you watch it. You're like, yeah. my God, these two are adorable. Like, you, you buy it. And, and at the same time, you also feel kind of bad because you're like, wait, hang on. And again, juxtaposed. Hang on, him, him and, aren't him and Rose kind of a bit of a thing yeah kinda, and you feel bad but like and they only play on that a little in the episode but rose kind of deals handles it more from the thing of seeing that he's hurt and af- yeah after all and, and yeah. in a way it's sort of showing her become less selfish yeah yeah she again becomes more of a of a of a theme as the sh- as the show goes on more mickey too mickey becomes a full-on companion in this story yeah. traveling with them and of course gets thrown into an adventure with a, a ship trying to repair itself with human body parts yes and- Banana creepy, daiquiris. Creepy clockwork robots, which are a wonderful design. Oh, so good. Um, they are so good. Like, you know those 12 in, the 12 inch dolls that came out in like 2007? Yeah, man, I took about I, 17 of them. I had a Cyberman. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's got about 17 of everything. I had I had a Cyberman and um, I'm sure I had another one. I can't remember which though. There was a Cyberman, there was a 10th Doctor, there was a clockwork robot, there was a Jadoon. Oh, I wanted um, the Jadoon, but I never managed to get hold of it because I just thought it looked cool. But uh, yeah, so I had a Cyberman. I've sold my Cyberman since. Uh, try saying that sober. Um, never. Uh, and then I, what do you call it? Uh, but I've, I've still got the Clockwork Droid because it's so well made. It's, it's really And when you peel the head off, the Clockwork head underneath is so good. Um, and it's the same scale as the Big Chief one, so that's why I've kept it. Ah, so, yes, yeah. of course. Yes, um, of course. And much better looking than the 10th Doctor and Martha figures that they did. Oh. Actually, no, the Martha sculpt was actually quite good. The 10th Doctor one, though, was abysmal. Yeah, the problem with the Martha sculpt is it's Martha. Hey, I will defend her next week. Yeah. So, uh, we, you know, Clockwork Droids, Area Sin, um, and again, like, just that, that idea of, of uh, self-contained story. The wonderful fairy tale imagery that Moffat revels in later. The idea mm. that this, this man emerges from the fireplace to stop the, the horrible monster living under the bed and all this stuff. Like it's 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 glorious and it's really well shot and it's so much fun and it's got a lovely bit of sweet ending. <clears throat> and it leads us into the first two part of this series Rise of the Cybermen and the Age of Steel. Another comeback for the uh Hey, you're struggling, with Mr. Cat. Another comeback <laughs> for the um classic for a classic monster. monster. Uh, which again sort of becomes a tradition at first the, uh, the, with these series where each series has a two-parter that reintroduces a classic foe. Yeah. Um, and the Cybermen get their turn this year. I don't love this two-parter too much. It's There's stuff I really like in it. I like fine. the idea of Rose seeing an alternate version of her mum and dad and what their lives are like and, you know, like <laughs> hating the fact that they don't have a kid but they've got a dog and they call it Rose. But also, um, you know, the, the idea of like, oh, is this a life I wish I had? Yeah, yeah. Um, Mickey getting the second chance with his grandmother to save her life, basically, or, or possibly do it. Ricky, that universe's version of him, who's an arsehole, uh, but also a, an activist and a saboteur to get rid of the, the evil companies and find out what's going Cybers on. Cybers Industries. Cybers Industries. The reason I don't like it is because it is it's Genesis of the Daleks. It's yeah. too close well, for, they, for think... me. To Genesis of the Daleks. Correct me if I'm wrong, but own. they give Mark Platt a based on credit for Spare Parts. Uh, yeah, I think so, but Spare Parts... It's very... It's it's absolutely tangentially related to Spare Parts in terms of plot, yeah. but yeah. But I think, like, it, to Moffat's credit, I think he does the idea of the Cybermen's kind of background better with, with his take on the main universe ones in in uh, uh, Doctor Falls and... and um, whatever part one of that one was like I think that one is a better version of the idea that's the one like the idea of seeing the Mondasian society in that for me is a lot more effective well that was than than this version where it's just like Roger Lloyd Pack is non-scarred Davros yeah but business is a bigger angle instead of war and that's the only kind of real difference to the the core of it I was just thinking I don't think it's it's about it's about finance and, and his personal fears for his own health. I don't think that they actually got the the to the core of what was menacing about the Cybermen, Cybermen originally until 
well enough in time, Doctor Falls. Yeah. yeah, which is weird. I love the design of the Cyber Cybermen. I think the design's great. These sort of pre Iron Man, Iron Man esque. Like, yeah, those sort of lumbering suits of armor, armor things. Yeah, that. Dun, 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 but again, dun, 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 usually accompanied with the getting away. Steps, like it really reinforces the idea that they are metal men. And, and even going so far as to show that there isn't necessarily, at least in this initial version of them, there isn't necessarily a human body in there. Well, that, there are nervous systems and nerve endings. That and is what parts of the brain takes away from it a bit for me. The fact that it is they basically just take a brain out and put it in a shell yeah. rather than it's this slow upgrading bit by well, bit. I, I always bought that as just for this story though, because because later on they. They show things being a bit more elaborate, like for all of its faults, Cyberwoman and Torchwood sort of shows mm. that shows that there is machinery developed that just converts around the human body. Um, Army of Ghosts later this series implies that a little as well with the factory element. Yeah, Pandorica opens shows that oh no, there's a, there's a skull inside that. Yeah, thing. yeah. so like they, they, as time goes by, it becomes more about just putting the body into something. Um, but I think for this one, it works quite well, especially when they open it up and stuff. And it's just like oh my god. This is just nerve endings and tissue. Yeah, like it's 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 horrifying for that moment. But this, these Cybermen definitely get used more interestingly in the Moffat era. Um, yes, but I love the design. I just this story doesn't blow me away so much. Uh, Idiot's Lantern. This is good fun. I love this one. I know it gets overlooked a bit or taken the piss out of, but you know you go my way, doll. The, is there any other way to go, Daddy O? Uh... <laughs> The Doctor and Rose having fun getting interrupted by an invasion of a, you know, radio wave based <clears throat> alien which takes people's faces. I mean, what's not to like? There's some great stuff in it. What's it, not to like? It's eerie and weird and goofy, and it, it's got that absolutely glorious bit where they're pretending to be, um, what's it, flag inspectors and <laughs> stuff ahead of the Queen's coronation and, uh, and rubber soles, swear by them and all that stuff. Like. <laughs> <laughs> David Tennant and Billy Piper's like look for this like Tennant's in the same costume as always but it's the hair yeah and Billy Piper is like dressed for the period and looks absolutely brilliant just the, the big old dress like they're just having so much fun the little the little mo- the little scooter yeah little moped and, and, and oh I, I enjoy this one a lot it's, it's I just, enjoy it a lot well it's, the, it's this point in the series that you get the good fun oh this is them at the at the sort of <clears throat> having joyous times which a lot of people find sickly we're gonna, but I, I think totally yeah we're gonna we're gonna see that yeah they do it for a reason we, we're gonna see that be ripped away from them in the last story which so. starts getting hinted out in the next story yes which is impossible planet impossible planet slash the satan pit one of my favorites of the rare, entire quite, new run that's quite a rare layout as well isn't it two part with a one part uh, with a single part are in betwixt they don't really do that after this i don't think but they do here series so it's because it's because go in the fireplace was earlier the, oh yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, of yeah. course, of course. We had four episodes, um, then a two part, one episode, then two part. But possible planet Satan Pit, holy shit! AKA great stuff. Doctor Who does aliens the first time. Great stuff. Uh, <laughs> great because they do it again later as Flesh and Stone. Yes. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, great creature design with the Ud. It's like creepy uh, occult sort of foreshadowing and semi Lovecraftian kind of yeah. look to them. Uh, the Beast and his armies shall rise from the pit to wage war with God. I'm sorry. It's like this sh- great I apologize. Like <laughs> old to the you know. Sort I was of... asking, would you like sauce with that? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, this is horrifying. Yeah, the, the atmosphere, the the, the 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 all the stuff with the air ducts and old to the classic base under sea stories. Base Toby Zed, simple stuff. Red eyes, the glyphs appearing on his skin. The score. Maury Gold goes yeah. like all all Lord of the Rings on this on this piece. There's Don't way more like turn around to me. If you look at me, I can touch you. Die. Uh, Gabriel Wolf, yeah, as the voice of the beast, yeah. A <laughs> uh, right, so I, I, I'm probably misremembering this, but I'm sure I read up on it because I was curious, and someone proved me wrong in the comments if I got this wrong. But I'm sure they didn't hire him because he'd been the voice of Sutek. No, they hired him, and then at some point after the casting, someone went, "You do realize he's been in this before as the voice of basically Space Devil?" Yeah. Like the Egyptian god of death from space. And then it added this beautiful extra thing of, oh, maybe they're all kind of the same thing. And this is all, <laughs> bra- this is these are all branching yeah. entities that come from the same that's idea. Something that comes up, yeah. And it's like, that's amazing. So it's like, again, it's sort of a subtle 
classic series villain return in a way. It came up in the fan base quite a lot at the time. On Outpost Gallif Room. Yes. Um, um, but it, it's a great touch. Scary, dude, freaky. They create a crew that you really get to like. And then kill most of them. <clears throat> yeah, you have the whole eerie scene with uh, Ida and the Doctor over the lip of the thing and he's like, that whole bit he talks about where it's like the urge where you just see something like that and you just want to jump. The urge to see what they're at. Like he's on the edge. Yeah. And that whole speech about like, you know, just, what does it mean? Like, I, could, I might die. I might not. Like, it's about finding out what there is. It's about taking yeah. that plunge and it, all that stuff is so good. The iconic orange spacesuit so iconic that they repainted it and then reused no. it a million times because it was cheaper to do so. Yeah. Um, but it looks good. It makes for a great action figure. Um, I love it. I think it's great. I love that two part so much, and it, it's it's like you say the seeds are sown. The, uh, the was it the lost child who, who was going to die in battle so very very soon. Yep. And the idea of the Doctor and Rose talking about maybe actually settling down and talking about getting a house. Well, yeah, um, because there is the, they lose the TARDIS. Yeah, so. they think they're going to be stuck. And, and you um, can see you can see his his world is is completely destroyed by that notion, but. You can see him coming round to the idea of doing it with her. Yeah. And and being happy. And also settling down. Hey! <laughs> Let's tear that away. Um, what is the immediate next one? The immediate next one is an episode I can't remember. Oh, hang on. So uh, we're doing this from memory because we're gubbins like that. New Earth. Well, Claw, it's shot and notice sooner, isn't it? Two Claw, Skull um, Reunion. Uh, Go to the Fireplace. I just do the Rise of Cyberman. Here's Lantern. This is it. da so we've got four episodes left. Uh, so this is Love and Monsters. Oh, fuck off. Love and Monsters, right. I hate Love and Monsters. I know you do, and you're wrong. Um, no, you're not. Opinions are not wrong, folks. Opinions can't be wrong, but they can be Unless you like Love and Monsters. Wrong. Love and Monsters is great, and I shall tell you for why. Tell me for why. It's bold. It's bold that they is even it, went or there. Or is it just irritating? It's bold. Oh, that they went there, son. It is. Um, and I think it's better than the next episode. Uh, Love and Monsters, the first Doctor Light story of the new series, a semi-tradition for the next few years, where uh, to free everybody up a little bit. It's a bit um, pants, though, isn't it? The main cast members are not in the episode a lot. Um, in this case, because it follows Elton, played by Mark Warren, who's bloody lovely, and a group of people who call themselves Linda. Because they're investigating the Doctor. They've all had encounters in some way. Oh, it's so bloody... Quaint and quirky. I fucking hate it. You become cynical. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's happened. It's finally happened. But it's the first episode where a Blue Peter uh, competition was involved. In yes. A, uh, a kid designed the Absorbal Off, played by Peter Kay. And uh, we let them. It's really. It, I think. The, I think his performance just split people <laughs> down the middle a lot. I think he's a great actor. He's a great comic actor. But I can see why it takes people out of it a little. But I don't mind. I really don't mind. I think he's better as Victor Kennedy, Victor Kennedy than he is as the Absorbal Off. Um, yeah, I'd give but you that. I'm up for it. Um, so I've heard. Fliss, uh, Fliss and Ursula and that really horrendous suggestion at the end of the last episode is that they have a love life. Um, uh, but ahead of its time, this was 2006, and the main character is vlogging. Yeah, like he's we don't see it. I mean, we don't see him posting it online or anything. Like he's clearly just making it for yeah. posterity. It's a video diary, but 2006 YouTube had only been around like a year. It had been around if a few that, months yeah. at the time of this being written. That's pretty ahead of its time. That's pretty damn cool. Uh, There's some great ideas in it. There's some great stuff that the Scooby Doo sequence toward the beginning toward the middle is quite funny. Yeah, that is quite good. Chasing the thing with the, the meat in buckets and stuff. Oh, no, with the steak and the buckets with the stuff. And the hoiks, an alien design so cool and expensive that they recycle it a couple of times and then butcher it, repaint it and use it as other creatures entirely in, um, what do you call it? Because uh, why wouldn't you? In uh, the Rings of Akatem. Uh. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's I, I, I like Love of Monsters a lot. I, I, get why people don't and i for a long time was like no it's a bit stupid but the more i look back at the more i'm like i miss stories like this it has it has stuff like the jackie scene where she confronts elton yeah on the fact the idea that he's getting close to her to sort of get close to the doctor and stuff with the idea of it yeah i and that she she talked about the ones left behind like no one ever thinks about the ones who've been left behind and it's like oh my god camille kajori gets to like 
show off her comedy and tragedy chops in this episode and nails it. Um, speaking of tragedy, the next story is Fear Her. It's all right. No, it's not. It's okay. No, it's not. No, it isn't. Fear Her has got some... It does not deliver on its promise. No. It's got some excellent all. ideas in it. It really has some excellent ideas. I mean, I could say the same thing about Love and Monsters. It's still trite. The, di- the difference for me is, I think, Fear Her kind of lives and dies on two things. The execution of the um, eeriness of the illust- illustrations and their role in the story. Yeah. And for some parts it works. The Scribble Monster is a charmingly daft-like idea. Yeah. And the picture's moving and the idea <clears throat> that she draws the Doctor and then the TARDIS disappears. Rose turns around and the TARDIS and the Doctor have gone. Like, that stuff's really eerie and creepy. But then just, like, the way they depict the, the menace of the father, which yeah. is a very dark and interesting story, just doesn't work. They just don't go far enough with it. Yeah, it's, it's, the it, problem. It's, it's, it's too subtle. But the other thing it lives and dies on is the performance of your child actor who is at the centre of the story. And I'm sorry, I do not think the Chloe Webb performance is good enough. It's it's comedic by accident. You know yeah. what I mean? Because she's so stuck in that, like, you know, I love Chloe Webb. And all that stuff is like... They should have let her emote and be herself a bit more before they did that stuff with yeah. the soulless. Yeah. Um, because I, I just I, I bought her mum's fear and worry. I didn't buy the kids' peril. It no. was ridiculous. But what well, we get the doctor running with the Olympic torch, which has aged and dated it really, really badly. badly. But yeah, do you know why it dated it though? Really significantly, because everyone said in the run up to twenty twelve for at least a bit of the torch lighting, a bit a bit of the marathon. Can we get David to do it in costume? Because at least then it's kind of a funny joke. You, you're doing the Brit- celebration of British culture as part of the different people running with it. You go, oh, there's Doctor Who. That's funny. And also then it's like, oh, it's funny because he did it in the thing. He wanted to do it for like a street. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But they didn't. Um, and it's like, uh, that would have made, I think that would have put the episode up a little higher because it would have been like, oh, it's that one that caused the real life thing. Uh, what is next? Now oh, we're part. getting into Army of Ghosts and Doomsday. Yes. Uh... This is a dream come true. Because the Cybermen and the Daleks have been in images together quite a lot. This was awesome. But they'd never been on screen together like this. And they'd never had a fight on screen. This was this was pure fan service. Yeah. Again, like I was saying about Rus- a lot of Russell and Zara being... Uh, things that fans have been thinking about the implications of for the through the wilderness years. Mm. And exploring it in their adventures and uh, BBC books and all that sort of stuff. To it actually getting to do a lot of that stuff. And explore it. And, of course, one of those things is... Who would win the Daleks or the Cybermen? (laughs) (laughs) You would destroy the Cybermen with four Daleks. We would destroy the Cybermen with one Dalek. You are superior in only one respect. What is that? You are better at dying. It's just, just like, such... oh! Oh, bitchy Daleks. Fantastic. Handbags at dawn. Oh. The Dalek, if I remember correctly, the, the Radio Times and a couple of other things spoiled that the Daleks would be coming back in some way. Yeah, I think so. But I managed to avoid a lot of it. It was 2006, guys. The internet wasn't readily available in everyone's palm at all times. So as a result, I knew that there was something dalek happening, but I didn't know if it was in the show. Like I thought maybe it was just like photo shoot or whatever. Yeah. So when they emerged out of the, uh, the void out of the void sphere at the end of part one, yeah, I was like, oh, oh my god, we're getting both of them, we're getting both of them in the same story. Um, magical stuff. The end of Rose's story, as far as we knew, yes, played and... beautifully. This is the day I died, because as far as Earth's records are concerned, our existence, she's not there anymore. She's gone. Yeah. Um. Jackie gets sort of a chance at a be- uh, sort of uh, uh, the life she missed and that she was longing for. Um, that dimension's Pete gets the chance to, to be a family again. Uh, we see Mickey. We find out that he's joined um, what's it, Andrew Hayden Smith's Jake uh, in fighting Cybermen. Yeah, and joined the destroying, resistance. Destroying, so Lu- destroying what's left of Lumix's legacy and learning that the Cybermen have been trying to breach dimensions to escape their, essentially escape their execution in that one. Like they've, yeah. they've ruined a lot of the world, but they've been kept at base, so now they're trying to escape elsewhere. Um, the idea of people befriending ghosts, 
this is one of those stories as well where like we come back after a period of time has passed yeah. to find that Earth is doing stuff that the Doctor and Rose are like, wait, what's this all about? Yeah. Which which comes back a lot later on as well, especially next series. It's a big thing next series, yeah. And that is so cool. Um, I I think I'll make Ghosts and Doomsday is a damn fine finale. Again, it, it was, you know, the, it was Russell defining his era as with event television. Yeah. Like creating event television. Tracy Ann Oberman. Like, yeah, great as, guest star. As, as, Yvonne Hall, as, a, as Yvonne Hartman. Oh, uh, yeah, she's good. She's um, Jackie as the companion, like, so the disguise, yeah. pretending she's Rose and all this yeah. stuff. It's quite funny. It's, um... <laughs> these first two seasons of Doctor Who are incredibly strong. And I guess they had to be because it was such a big thing that they were bringing this show back. And if it had failed, if it had been comic... Yeah. People would have laughed it off the screen, but it was just comic enough, yeah, for people to fall in love with it again, and 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 people to fall in love with it from scratch. Do they keep it up though? Find well, out next week. Yeah, Big Damn Cast on Twitter, Big Damn Stream on Twitch.tv. You can also support the show for as little as one dollar a month on patreoncom slash Cast. Yes, get a bunch of perks, including photos of my nipples. Nope, no photos. Of anyone's nipples. Okay, check check the Patreon page just to be sure. I'm sure, I'm sure the nipples are on the phone. Nope, nope. Or they can be I don't know. We're gonna go now. Starting to get old. Back to the phone. No, next to the phone.